Yolanda Cacabate Navarro is a conservationist from Ecuador. Do you have to change the title of this too, yeah? <laughs> After studies in educational psychology at the Catholic University of Quito, she became involved in environmental issues. She was a founder of Fundación Natura, which means Nature Foundation in Quito, and was its executive director from 1979 to 1990. She's also um, chair of the, um, of the advisory board of Fundación Futuro Latinoamericano, which means the Foundation for the Future of Latin America, a regional NGO dedicated to conflict management in Latin America. And she's not just chair of the advisory board, she was the founder of, uh, of this foundation. Um, she's really a, a, social, a serial social entrepreneur. Um, in 1992, she coordinated the civil society participation in the Earth Summit. Um, in Rio, and from 1996 to 2004, she was president of IUCN, the um, World Conservation Union. And from August 1998 to January 2000, she served as Minister of the Environment in the Government of Ecuador. Since 2010, she's president of the Worldwide Fund for Nature, the international group based in Guam, Switzerland. She's a member of the um, board of uh, Holstein Foundation for Sustainable Construction and was a board member of the member of the board of directors of the Ford Foundation. Um, she's also been a member of um, the uh, environmental advisory boards of Coca-Cola and Holstein, she's a big cement company, and um, Ms. Kakabatse is a member of the board of directors of the Inter-American Dialogue. She has uh, won a lot of awards, including the Order of the Golden Ark, the Global 500 Award of UNEP, the Zayed Prize, and uh, she has an honorary doctorate in science from the University of East Anglia. And uh, Sara Catalan says on behalf of the whole class, Bienvenida, <laughs> Ms. Cagabatze. Thank you for being here with us tonight. And... Uh, <laughs> And I don't know if you would like to um, say a few things or answer questions first. Maybe I, I just uh, I just give you a, a short introduction of what am I doing now. Yes. Um, and I hope that is helpful. In this very moment, I am babysitting. Uh, and, uh, and I have two grandchildren in London, and one of them, the eldest, who is going to be four next week, has chicken pox. Oh, no. <laughs> so here I am, um, uh, having a fascinating time with this young guy, uh, 24 hours a day. Yeah. <laughs> so that is great. Um, I, I hope that several of you, or all of you, um, are familiar with the panda with a panda symbol of uh, WWF. Uh, maybe that is the activity that is taking most of my time today. And what I'm doing is um, uh, what, what one is meant to do at the board level, which is giving guidance to uh, policies uh, that for the institution that is a very large network uh, worldwide. It's in every continent, in every region of the world. and. Uh, and of course has priorities of the main ecosystems of the world, like the Amazon, the Congo Basin, um, the Coral uh, Triangle, um, in places, the Arctic, in places that are, uh, are quite threatened by, uh, a, I would say, uh, over extraction of resources by climate change, and uh, in general by uh, lack of public policy related to the need to keep um, these places uh, in, in a good state uh, for the future, as a capital of, of humanity. Um, I'm also working in Latin America in, on climate change issues. I've, I've always been, uh, a, I, I have always been attracted to public policy. and. Um, 
the political world is always a fascination because it is so diverse, so unexpected, so evolving in, in every year and in, in every government. And what we are doing, I'm doing with a group of people in, in Ecuador at this moment, is leading a process for Latin America and the Caribbean on public policy to reduce the threats of climate change on anything that that government requires in terms of information and research and data that can help this decision maker um, uh, propose a public policy for that country, for that city, for that region. So the combination of WWF and, um, and these climate change activities, I, uh, I would say, are totally complementary. And uh, what I value most of this is the amount I'm learning. It is an everyday experience of uh, getting to know more, of recognizing new data, of being informed of uh, good and bad things. But as always, what keeps me going is that there are always good things to tell, good stories. So I stop there. Um, and would you welcome any question or comment or um, request to, to tell you anything about my life? Thank you. Um, I think I'll start because Sara left me some questions. Um, and uh, I think that uh, the first one is related. You started with a panda, and so she had uh, a question about it. She said, World Wide Fund for Nature is famous for its design. Can you tell us more about the use of design in your organization and how it affects its communication strategy? Um, it is absolutely essential. Uh, I, I don't belong to that world, and therefore I have very often difficulty in understanding why do we have to invest so much in design in uh, not not uh, the text of um, newsletters or declarations uh, that in writing I, I keep close to that and I understand how important a comma can be or the wrong word can be but in terms of design of images, um, I understand that uh, the majority of our uh, members around the world are attracted because they see in the image something they care about. You have probably seen uh, the, the bear, the polar bear, uh, in, the, in the communication strategy of WWF and Coca-Cola, for example. Uh, that the, the messages that we deliver through those commercials are so um, so strong in terms of touching chords that uh, we all humans care about children, uh, middle-aged people, more uh, elderly people like me. That people react immediately and do want to act uh, in support of the organization. Um, and I can say that whenever we have made mistakes about communication, uh, we have done a good job in terms of image and of, um, in terms of uh, being assertive and clear about what we mean by those images. We have, we have either lost uh, space in that society or trust or uh, we have lost members. And sometimes that members means uh, losing also income. Okay, thank you. Um, another question she has is, um, uh, what are the challenges you have faced in your career when addressing issues that might not be the priority to many people in power? Uh, they, used, uh, they lose interest. Uh, one of the, my challenges when I was Minister of the Environment was how do I connect to the other ministries and to other ministers? Uh, how can I uh, convince them or uh, have their willingness to support the project or the programs or a joint program with the, minister, uh, the Ministry of the Environment? Taking into account that in many parts of the world at the end of the 90s, environment was, um, you know, a crazy 
lot of greens that care about national parks and birds and trees and plants and water, but, but not the, the, the environmentalists were not seen as a key member, a key player in the development process. So um, I, I remember having a very difficult time in uh, convening uh, other ministers and convincing them that we needed to work together. And little by little, I did manage, because what I did was to identify issues that were very, very um, relevant to their agenda, as well as to the, the environmental one. And I'll give you a couple of examples. With the Minister of Health, we designed a, a project that had to do with availability and quality of water. And the Minister of Health was highly supportive and reacted in favor of the proposal because uh, about 60% of the child mortality was caused by um, sickness that came from uh, bad quality of water. So the moment that I discussed these numbers, these percentages, and the relevance of doing something about uh, protecting rivers, the course of rivers, and dealing with uh, disposals of uh, garbage and uh, polluted waters in of small villages, towns, and cities, he immediately got the point of how relevant it would be to the population of Ecuador, and we started working together. Um, if uh, you, you probably don't remember, I cannot see your faces, but I suspect you are much younger than I am. But uh, uh, some uh, 10 years ago, Ecuador signed a peace agreement with Peru. We had been at war for more than 50 years, and we uh, finally uh, gave up the stupid, um, the stupid war between our two neighboring countries that did so much damage to everybody. Immediately after the peace agreement, I proposed to the Minister of Defense that now that we were not going, that is Ecuadorians, going to invest uh, large parts of our budget in uh, armament and in defending, defending the, the boundaries of Ecuador, we should start defending the quality of the territory. And that meant reforestation, protection of forests, protection of rivers, um, uh, dealing with the main ecosystems of Ecuador. And that was also a fascinating and very attractive uh, uh, challenge and, and invitation to, to the defense people. And then uh, there were always good arguments to the Minister of Agriculture, as you can imagine, in terms of food security, the quality of soil, how much soil we were losing um, by uh, processes of deforestation and erosion, um, what it meant to be using um, chemicals that were not used anywhere else in the world that we were using in Ecuador and other countries of the region. Uh, in terms of uh, production, the industry, how important it, it was to deal with the technological issue of emissions, <coughs> emissions that polluted air or water or soil. So um, delivering the right message in the language of your potential partner is something that is highly relevant if you want to infiltrate yourself into the blood system of that institution. Now, you've worked with Coca-Cola and Holcim and other companies. Um, do you think the private sector is uh, following more sustainable business models? I mean, did you go to Davos? That Their theme was resilience. Did they make any link between resilience and uh, ecosystem resilience? I didn't go to Davos this year. I have been to Davos several times in the past. So I, I don't have a first-hand experience that my colleague, the, the CEO of WWF, was there. And yes, definitely, Mary, we see every year that we have more partners or more potential partners to work with. And, and WWF is, is criticized for working with the private sector. But we are absolutely convinced that unless we work with the private sector, they, our achievements would be very, very small. 
And being able to enlarge this group of decision makers around the world who are working on issues related to water, to fisheries, to food production, to energy production, is highly relevant to us. Not That doesn't mean that those individuals are convinced, <coughs> totally convinced about the importance of sustainable development or the relevance of, a, of being a, a, t- taking care of, of the environment and ecology. But I don't care as long as they do it. If they are doing it because it's good for their image, it's because uh, if they don't do it, they would be criticized by society. What, what does it matter? As long as that individual is leading the organization in the right direction, uh, I, of course, care more for those people who are totally convinced that uh, those who are doing it because it's good for their image and the results are equally good, so what? Um, one of the things that um, was a little distressing about the, um, the uh, UN more recent meeting in Rio, Rio Plus 20, is it didn't uh, come to uh, any stirring conclusions or challenges. Um, and so when we turn to governments, do you think governments are really addressing environmental issues as one of their top priorities? I was very disappointed, as, as you were also probably, uh, Mary, but I was disappointed because I saw that uh, in the last 20 years, government had walked backwards. It was more or less the, like the effect of the crap. They moved forward in 1992 um, with a lot of strength and investment and political decision. And now, in the last 10 years, we are back. We are back into a state of uh, the 90s. And basically, I think that there is a tremendous push uh, of several sectors of society, mainly in the developed world, in the industrialized world, that's they, because they see that um, environmental concerns are an obstacle that would slow down processes. And and they are right. They are right. Environmental concerns do slow down processes. The big difference is that by slowing it down, we can guarantee the success or the permanence of a resource in the long term. And if that doesn't happen, when you don't, um, when you don't invest in environmental, in reducing environmental impact, you just want, want to win in the short term, and who cares about the future? That, that is, those are the two positions in the balance today, and unfortunately many, too many decision makers in the world have withdrawn from that first line of uh, piloting a different form, a different shape of development. So we can mention um, the Netherlands, we can mention France, we can mention um, Spain, definitely. Um, I would say those are the most uh, outstanding. On the other hand, you find that there are some countries that uh, are moving forward in, uh, in their environmental agenda, like South Korea. I would say that even the U.S., although you don't have a national, federal policy that is very strong and something that we can be proud of, at the, at the state level, lots of very good things are happening in the Northeast states, in California. There are several, several states that are really working on being much more uh, sustainable, coherent, with the ambitions for the present and for the future. So things are happening. But going back to Rio, what I think we have to analyze is whether uh, the UN system is working still as we thought, uh, as we saw it working in the past. The Rio 2012 was disappointing because the institution, the UN institution, was not able to put together the, the will of decision makers of the world for this important event. And we ended up with a very wishy-washy 
a declaration that doesn't give us all that much. And uh, even the name of the declaration is the future we want. I don't know whether we need to care for it. Just uh, stop to a few minutes to think everything that we want. We probably would want a Rolls Royce or an apartment in Acapulco and another one in the uh, Mediterranean or whatever. It is the future we need. It is the future we can have. At this moment, our generation today, you in your classroom and me here in London, we are consuming a planet and a half. We are eating a half of a planet that belongs to your generation. So that when you become my age, you will find that you have only half the resources that we did, or a third of what we did. And that is terribly unethical, and it is terribly irresponsible, and we need to work on that. And, and the UN, as I said, at the UN Forum in Rio um, 2012 was not able to deliver that strong message. Why do you think um, we have trouble acting as a, as a, as a planet, as a, as a globe, a global community? You were, one of the things that uh, was not in Sara's uh, introduction is that uh, Yolanda was the uh, co-chair of the Millennium Development Goals uh, Task Force on Environmental Sustainability. And in that document, there were goals for, um, that, that would lead us to sustainability and they required the political will as much or more than money. Um, and yet, we find that we came to the date when the, uh, what year was the, uh, the Millennium Development Goals um, were to be achieved, and, uh, and the UN just sort of said, never mind. There is, uh, so, uh, what other, is there, if the UN doesn't act, how else can we work in a concerted way globally? Your first question, Mary, was related to, to how do we deliver messages. And I think we, the environmentalists, have done a very bad job in communicating what are we talking about uh, when we speak about the environment and to other actors, to other sectors of society. And the result of that has been that we have lost credibility. In fact, I, uh, I'm not a radical, except on a very few ethical issues. But in general, I believe that you have to listen to other actors and understand their fears and their interests to be able to, to sell or to market your message to their agendas. And by being radicals and throwing stones and accusing um, uh, actions or leaders around the world, what we have, the result has been that we have been put into a corner. And, uh, and we have lost credibility and people have lost interest in listening to the environmental message. And basically because we have not been able to weave uh, our message into what development is about. And, and again, I go back to health, for example, health security. Every, every new vector that is appearing now because of climate change is a threat to the human being. And we are not uh, marketing the message that deforestation and climate change and water pollution and destruction of ecosystems is at the base uh, of, of these new vectors appearance or the change of, of behavior of known vectors. Can you imagine that we have malaria now in Titicaca? Titicaca, which is about nearly 4,000 meters high. So something is happening in the planet that we know, the environmentalists, and we are not um, in a concerted action, as you say, Mary, being able to, to uh, build our way into the, the system of uh, debate, of, of uh, development. The same thing with uh, climate, with energy security or food security. Uh, those are relevant issues. They are matters of life and death. But we are not seeing the environmentalists as key players in that uh, in that uh, game, in that discussion. But of course, it doesn't happen everywhere around the world. There are places, countries. Um, and organizations that have done a very good job in, in creating that awareness, but it's not enough. It's not a global thing. 
Now I've asked half of Sarah's questions and I think I'll keep the rest for later to open it up to uh, the class, your questions for Yolanda. Yes, please. Could she give us some examples of, of places that are doing it well, that have been successful in communicating the, the critical needs? Did you hear the question? No, no. Can you repeat it, please? Um, do you want to come up and ask the question? Oh. I think you get the impression because no one's sitting in the first four chairs that this, we go. that we've got right to get. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, um, do, can you give us some examples of some countries that are doing a good job or some locations or, or um, areas where you feel like they have addressed these critical climate uh, issues and related and woven them together like you spoke about in a way that, that is communicated well? Of a country that is very rich in terms of its biodiversity and ecosystems, Costa Rica has done a wonderful job in marketing nature as part of development. And uh, uh, those of you who've been to Costa Rica, you would have seen that uh, national uh, protected areas are a priority for the country. The same thing as energy. If you just think that a few years ago, Costa Rica called a referendum, a public vote, uh, to decide on nature or oil, because they found oil in the territory. And the people, the population of Costa Rica voted against oil because they knew that if they dedicated um, their development efforts into uh, oil exploration, protected areas would lose. And protected areas today in Costa Rica are so important that a very important part of their income comes via ecotourism. So that is one example. Another example is uh, Japan and uh, uh, Germany with technology on, uh, for um, uh, alternative renewable energy, wind, um, solar. Uh, those, those, um, uh, that technology developed by those countries are changing the world and China is now doing the same thing. And it is changing my world in Ecuador and Africa and Asia and Europe. If you go to Spain, you will see forests of uh, windmills producing energy uh, through wind. So you see that there are important efforts. And, and, but then I go to California, where you can, you can produce at your house level or, or in the sector where you live or in the village or in the farm, you can produce renewable energy and link it to the grid. And your meter, your energy meter, will move forward if it's using conventional uh, electricity energy, and it will move backward if it's using uh, renewable energy. And you only pay for the difference. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah, if you think that the sun is free for all, why aren't we working more on that? And it is coming because of the investment in technology, and I would say the same thing is happening with, uh, with uh, transport, with uh, vehicles, uh, the, the fact that we are getting into electric vehicles will make a big difference. Of course, we need to think how do we reduce the number of cars around the world and how do we move as a society to use more public transportation. That is the challenge of today. But that also means that we have to rethink cities. Cities today uh, are just crazy. Our bad houses, doesn't matter whether it's Quito or New York or uh, Tokyo or London. But then we have to think of issues like uh, school buses, for example. I'm, I'm in London and my son lives here. And my grandson is going to the school of the neighborhood. And you are not allowed to go to a school that uh, takes you into private transportation. And it is a matter of transportation, not education. The school has to be good in your neighborhood so that your parents choose the best school for you, and that means walking distance. 
Um, if you are ready to pay a very strong fine to take a school bus to take you across the city, maybe you have to pay for that. And no one wants to pay for that. So we have to think about these policies, public policies, by which we um, move uh, citizens into thinking more wisely of how do you shop in the vicinity that is walking distance, how do you go to the medical services in your community, how do you use the school in your community, and how do you link, like you and I are linking right now via Skype, uh, how do you link to your business dialogues instead of mobilizing yourself um, from one country to another or from one city to another in the same country or one neighborhood to another creating these terrible traffic jams that are causing so much damage in terms of climate change. So um, there, are, there are fantastic examples everywhere in terms of agriculture also. It is how do we produce more with less? with less water, with less extension of soil, of land, uh, with less chemicals and fertilizers. How do we produce more quality, more quantity? And that has to do with fantastic debates, discussions, and realities like water. What the water use, um, uh, are there vegetarians in your group, maybe? How many people are vegetarian? <laughs> I'm going Say to tell about you a, eight or nine. I, I'm going to tell you a horrible story, and it's not a story, it is a reality. But every time you eat a steak of red, red meat, you are drinking between three and 17,000 liters of water. 3,000 or 70,000, uh, 17,000, anything in that range. If that is crazy, if can't, we can't accept that eat, to eat red meat, we are consuming that much water because that cow uh, needed that amount of water to, uh, to irrigate the land in which they pasture, to eat the food, the additional food that they are given, and the water that is taken to there and to, to whatever they, they grow, or sometimes deep water from deep down to, to provide to uh, cattle. So the whole process until it comes to your plate implies between 3,000 and 17,000 liters of water. That is terrible. It has to do with with us as a society of not realizing, um, not not internalizing those costs, not being interested sometimes for them. And then you have waste. Uh, do you know how much, what is the percentage of packaged food that goes to the waste around the world? In New York, here in London, in Quito, in South Africa, in uh, Kenya, or in Sweden. Anyone want to take a guess? Can, just take a someone, guess. Someone just said up to 60%. 60%? 60%? Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, sardines or tuna, uh, tomatoes, lettuce, milk, meat, yogurt, cheese, anything that is packaged in the supermarket, 43% of that goes to waste every day. That is crazy. That is not acceptable. Do we call ourselves responsible, intelligent, and... Uh, and um, a solidarian with the rest of the world? No, we cannot call ourselves any of those if we continue to waste so much as we do today. And, and don't think about other materials that are not necessarily good. Have you heard the term locavore? Locavore is a new term for people who eat things that are grown nearby and eat in farmers markets. For example, in New York City, in every neighborhood, um, there's one or two days a week when farmers come with their produce and there's a direct exchange of
money for local produce. And uh, also in my neighborhood, there's a collection of compost. Does, do you all have that in your neighborhood? I, I know that, um, who was that? Who had a project on that? Josh. 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 Yeah. <laughs> He's got a compost. I'm using, I'm using your voice. Oh, sorry. Um, we were just, uh, one of the things these students have done, they're all um, social innovators. And uh, one, uh, one of the members of our class has been very active in composting. And he has everyone in this class composting, even though we're city dwellers. Um, I'll have to ask one of, one of the questions. The that, uh, that Sada had on her list is, what are 10 things everyone can do every day to have a positive impact on the environment? You've talked about choice of food, for example. Um, you've talked about energy. Um, what are other things that choices people can make to have a positive impact? Uh, energy, transportation, for oh, yeah, example. Said that. Um, it, it has to do with uh, how do I charge my cell phone and what do I do with the plug after I, I have fully charged my phone, whether I disconnect it from the wall or not. Very few people do. And if I leave the charger uh, on the plug, it continues to use energy. Um, turning off the lights, I, that, is, that is part of the culture of the West today. We, we think of every light bulb as inevitable, as, as it's always been there. Um, and, and of course, every, every light that you have on in a building, when sometimes we need whole buildings and offices, turn the lights on uh, for the whole night. Or the, it's crazy. And then something, let me tell you a short story about Ban Ki-moon. Uh, in the UN, one day, he must have been briefed about energy consumption. One day, he wrote a note to all the staff of the UN in New York, saying that from the following day, people had to dress properly, according to the season. If it was summer, go with short sleeves. And if it is winter, take a sweater because the air conditioning and the uh, heating system was going to go up this far and low this far and nothing beyond that, those limits. So if you think you are going to be cold, bring the sweater. Mm -hmm. Or if you think you're going to be hot, bring your sweater at home. And that saved the main building on First Avenue $47,000 in a month. Wow. It's crazy. So if, if he did it in an office, we have to think that we can do it at home. It is crazy how in the middle of the summer you go uh, into places where you freeze. You definitely get a cold and I get sinus. But that is part of my life every time I land in an airport. <laughs> and, and that is wrong. There's something very wrong with us trying to pretend that it is a different temperature in, inside than outside. Of course, there are extreme temperatures around the world and one needs to protect oneself, um, but that is not the common, a, a common issue all around the world. So uh, uh, this, this issue about heating and air conditioning is important. Transport is important. Lights and plugs at home. Um, water, water and water. Uh, how many when do you use your dishwasher? How long do you shower? Um, I found in the in a home of a friend of mine last week in Bogota a little uh, sand clock uh, made for the shower. It sticks uh, to the to the to the shower wall, and it says your shower should last this long. The moment you get in, you turn this sand clock, um, how do you call it, sand clock or sand watch? Hourglass. 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 You turn it to the other side the moment you get, you turn the, the, the water on uh, in the shower, and you should finish by the time the, the, the sand has passed, gone to the other side. And that is, uh, sorry, it was three minutes? Three minutes or four minutes? And it was enough. I tried it, and it was perfect. <laughs> and of course, I hated the message because I love long showers. But, but even though one loves 
you know, these luxuries in the world one has to take account of, of scarcity. But the, I mean, I found my life was measurably more unhappy when I lived in Pakistan in the countryside, and I perfected the uh, one bucket shower and hair washing system. <laughs> uh, I'll share it sometimes you know, to do it to, to get your hair rinse clean and your body clean. It takes some skill. It takes one bucket of water, one empty bucket, and, and you can do it. Um, yeah. Are there other questions for um, Yolanda that uh, you'd like to ask? Another one that uh, Sarah had, I'm sorry about that, um, is uh, that uh, she said, what insights would you share with us, future social innovators, who want to successfully communicate our messages? A lot of these people are great um, designers. Um, I don't know if you saw your little introduction by Sarah Catalan, but it was visually beautiful. You'll have to look at it later. But uh, the, this classroom is filled with uh, innovators with beautiful taste. <laughs> <laughs> you know that uh, I have seen so, not, not so many, but a lot of innovation in recycling. And uh, I'm fascinated every time I find something new. The other day, I was given a handbag made out of seat belts, old seat belts, and it is so elegant, you can't imagine. It's absolutely, you know, an Italian design, you think you're getting the best brand in the world, and then you see that it's old uh, uh, seat belts from cars. And, and uh, I think we are all, as a society, as a consumer society, giving more and more value to this sort of innovation. Um, when, you, when you see uh, a fleece jacket made out of pet bottles of Coca-Cola, you wonder, and, you, and then you believe that anything can happen in the world. To turn a pet plastic bottle into a fleece jacket, and you don't even notice which one is natural fleece and which one is pet made. It is fantastic. So uh, my message to this um, group of innovators is think outside of the box. That is the success of today. And think about how do we reuse materials. If constructors are using the material of old buildings that they used to take into a landfill, and today they are reconstructing that material to use it again in new buildings. And if car makers are using old cars to produce new ones, then anything can happen. But then also let's think about creating new models of consumerism. Um, for example, um, can is it possible to reach a state society where I rent my TV and when it's old or broken, I give it back and the, the factory gives me the replacement of the new one so that I avoid this moment of not having what to do with this old TV and adding to the garbage pile? Can we do that with cars, with fridges, with computers, that you don't buy the equipment, you buy the, the time of use of the equipment, that it continues to belong to the producer? Wouldn't that be great? I think it would make a tremendous difference in the world. We actually have a student in, our, in this group who has a vision of taking uh, designer clothes and having it be chic to wear um, clothes with repairs on them, with patches, or it shows a sort of respect for the original design and uh, a different way of when, I don't know what it was like when, you know, we're about the same age, and um, I was in high school in Argentina, and I remember everyone had maybe three or four outfits. That was it. You, you know, there, that was, you, you took care of your clothes. When they ripped, they were repaired. You even had your stockings rewoven. I don't know who. And, yes. And, yes. Uh, and yet today, people think it's very normal to go shopping for clothes as a hobby 
and the clothes are heavily subsidized, so people have vast arrays of clothes. It, it's just a different. Uh, it, it's you know there there are some things, some some uh, letters that circulate around the internet on, on Facebook where old people talk about how you know maybe they didn't know about recycling, but yes, we didn't throw away not on stockings. We we lost them. They had to run. So it's a different attitude towards materials in one's life and. I think we need to get back to that. Uh, yeah, oh, back that. To, to some basics that um, should be a process of, come out of a process of thinking about what I mentioned before. How is it possible that today we are consuming more than we have? And some people say, what do you mean by that? And I'll give you an example. Some years ago, or a couple of decades ago, we used to fish a very large fish. And that size of a fish would satisfy several people uh, at the table. Today, because we are fishing so much, we are fishing every time a smaller size fish that is not able to reproduce itself before it's taken by, by humans. So. In, in a few years' time, we will find that that species of fish is no longer there because we started uh, catching those animals that were not uh, adult enough to reproduce, and therefore we are just um, uh, threatening uh, not one but many species in the ocean. And, and that means that you know the next generation will not have it, which is crazy. Um, thank you. Well, my question was, um, why don't you come up? So sure. Um, it was actually, so following up on what you were talking about, about the sharing <coughs> businesses who essentially leased out their products to consumers and then uh, took them back. Do you have any examples of companies that are, um, that are doing that effectively? Um, I've heard of it happening, but I'm just not sure if there are any examples um, of that. I think that the first one, uh, was Volkswagen, the car maker in, in Germany. They were the first to do it and they continue to do it. They ask their, their Volkswagen drivers mm -hmm. to bring back the car whenever they want to get rid of it. And so they just disassemble it and, and uh, reuse the material. Uh, but I know that there are several others uh -huh. and I'm sure you will find that in, in the internet. Okay, thank you. Yeah. But I would love to have that with fridges and TV sets yeah. and, oh, yeah. and everything. Computers. And or uh, William McDonough said, what if we could eat everything? <laughs> you know, everything would be made out of uh, things that aren't poisonous and not poisoning us. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Others, uh, any comments or questions? Okay, I'll ask uh, another one no, from... Uh, I actually would. Oh, yes? Okay, someone's coming up with a, with a question. Uh, would you mind talking a little bit more about some of the challenges and successes in, in getting uh, the landmark environmental policies passed? What it takes and what type of people and what type of relationships you found to be most successful to get sort of higher level uh, things that are good for our environment passed through government? Okay. Um, I'll give you two which are very recent in, uh, in China. Um, in China, Singapore, and Hong Kong. Uh, those societies um, love to eat uh, shark fins, and uh, shark fin soup is one of the most uh, delicate dishes of uh, China or in Singapore and Hong Kong. Um, we have managed to have, in the private sector of Singapore and Hong Kong, uh, more than 150 hotels and restaurants who have taken out uh, shark fin soup from their menu is on a voluntary basis and in an agreement of the sector. 
of the of the restaurant sector of hotels and, and restaurants. That policy did not come from the top, from the government. It was a voluntary decision of the private sector to do it, and it is a something that probably in several years will, will become governmental uh, policy. But today, it's a behavior, uh, a very responsible behavior that has made a change. But uh, this happened last year, more, more or less 18 months ago. But about four months ago, the government of China for, took a decision that no shark fin soup would be served in any event, governmental event, of a reception of any kind, at this very small level in the village or at the national level in Beijing. That is a public policy that really surprised everybody because it's very difficult to read into the Chinese culture of policy making, and we never knew how much of an impact we were having on the Chinese government whenever we were delivering this information about the, the endangered uh, sharks all over the world. And it's not only in the Chinese vicinity, but most, not most, but a lot of those fins come from the Galapagos Islands, for example, in Ecuador. Uh, many sharks found dead without fins because illegal boats uh, fish uh, sharks, cut the fins, and take them to to China. So that decision taken by the Chinese government was absolutely not only surprising but fantastic in terms of an impact. Um, a, there is a town, and I cannot remember the name of the town in Australia, that has taken the decision not to allow bottled water into the town. I found that also absolutely exceptional. Because if a city council, if a city government is certain that the quality of the water they serve is very high standard, they have a very good point in saying, drink that water instead of creating so much garbage. With, with the recycling of all the plastic bottles that, that we consume in our society. That decision, again, it's a small level, but important. Another private decision, uh, Unilever, it's maybe the largest retailer of food in, in the world. They would buy only um, certified fish. And that means that the fishing company has to have a certification that they have fished in waters that are safe, that the quality of the fish is good, that the size of the fish that they are catching is acceptable, and that they are not destroying an ecosystem in the ocean. And to have a company that is designed to make money to suddenly announce that from that day on they would only buy certified fish and have a fabulous impact on thousands and thousands of fishermen and fishing com uh, companies is again of a, of a great impact in, uh, uh, in the global society. Um, a, in the case of, uh, of Costa Rica, I mentioned a policy that no oil will be explored and that uh, by 2020, Costa Rica will depend on renewables only. Is again, a fantastic policy. Um, let me think, I'm, I'm trying to think. This, this one of, uh, that I mentioned in, here in London about schooling and the children have to go to the local school uh, of the vicinity, it's another policy of, of great impact. Mm. I know that there are millions of policies, and, uh, <laughs> but I hope that with the ones I've mentioned that, that uh, have made a difference. It would be interesting if there were um, a clearinghouse for 
all these accumulated local policies that any municipality could review to see what might be um, policies that a, a, a local government might want to employ because uh, they probably haven't heard of uh, that kind of uh, indirect transportation impact policy or the um, other than the water bottle policy, you know, that, that sort of I, thing. I think that you would find those, uh, that sort of cleaning house of information by sector. For example, in the forestry sector, um, a, there are uh, policies worldwide about forests, tropical forests, what you cut, where do you cut, how do you use uh, plantations, a native forest and protection of biodiversity. So um, in an institution like CIFO in, uh, in Indonesia would probably give you lots of information about forest policy. In water institutions, the, there is a very good institution in Sweden, in Sweden the Water, uh, water Institute. Mary, I don't know if you yeah, can remember no, the name. Yeah, the one that, yeah. Is, is an institute that collects sure. information worldwide. Or uh, in biodiversity, the Biodiversity Convention. Uh, or CITES. CITES is meeting uh, now this week. In Bangkok. Or, or met last week. Um, and CITES is the, the institution that, is, that takes care of uh, species in trade trade of species worldwide, they have done one wonderful job in, uh, in terms of policy of what to hunt, what not to hunt, what, uh, what sort of uh, uh, information you need to provide in order to uh, get a, uh, permission to transport species from one continent uh, to another uh, and to market them. So the, I think that by sector, you would find fantastic information. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for a last question, because the hour has flown by. Um, does anyone have a, a final question? Um, uh, basically, in, in your... Can you hear her? No. no. I guess to sum up. Um, I, in your career, what policy changes, like these ones that you've given examples of, have you seen um, that that has been a struggle and has been a big accomplishment that you're really proud of? Mm. I guess in Ecuador. Yeah, and I think Ecuador, <laughs> the, the reserve uh, with Germany. In a policy that has had an impact in Ecuador or on Ecuador? Either. Either way. <laughs> Either way. One that was a real struggle, that you really had to work very hard to bring people together because resource conflict management is your specialty after all. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I, I can think of two in Ecuador. One is um, there are uh, the indigenous peoples groups in the Amazonian part of Ecuador that are um, in voluntary isolation. They just want to, don't want to meet the West. And they hide in the forest and they are dangerous. They are, uh, they have often killed people who, who have uh, wanted to go into their forest, into their area. And uh, they, when I was at the ministry, my problem was that, that Ecuador found oil in those areas that were at the same time protected areas, national parks. So protected community because they wanted to be in isolation, a protected area because it was very rich in biodiversity, and oil that is you know, a, a big magnet for uh, developers of the traditional uh, model of development. And uh, uh, I invented a new category of protection, which was called untouchable, untouchable areas. And I designated uh, two areas in the, in the Amazonian forest of Ecuador as untouchable. And my point was, uh, don't 
disturb these people until they want to come out. We should not be the ones that break into their land. And don't touch these forests uh, that belong to those peoples without which they, those people cannot live. And of course, my real argument at the bottom of it was don't extract oil from both areas. Um, it was terribly tough. We managed to do it. And today it is my personal conflict because I can uh, uh, see a tremendous struggle between the government intention of extracting oil and at the same time um, the big debate we have in Ecuador of whether we can get or earn money by keeping the oil underneath and by saving what is above, uh, which is biodiversity and, of course, the culture of those communities. Uh, and, and our struggle is in the design of a proposal that can bring funds into the country and that can pay off for not touching the oil and keeping the oil underneath. And this, if it works, would become a, a fantastic instrument not only for Ecuador but for other countries that have the same conflict of very valuable, very rich biodiversity with, uh, with uh, oil or uh, coal or any uh, non-renewable resource. That is a conflict that comes and goes. Uh, today, the world seems to be desperate for mining and is threatening policies that we have built in the past in different parts of the world. So that is a, 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 it's something that is not yet resolved. Maybe the one I feel more at heart uh, in my heart is something very relevant, is that the peace agreement between Peru and Ecuador came about with the designation of a very small plot of land that became a peace park. It was a territory of Ecuador in the Peruvian territory. The, we created a, an area of no more than 20 hectares or about 50 acres in a territory that was not within our country, but it belonged to us. And it was designated as a peace park for both of us to respect. That is something that it's, it, nobody thought it would happen, uh, that we could forget, leave behind 50 years of hating each other and come to recognize that we were neighbors, that we were the same background, the same people, the same race, the same everything, ethnic group, and that we could do much better in peace than in war. And, and the symbol of that is a, this very small plot of land called the Peace Park. Oh, thank you, and congratulations, and uh, thanks for being with us and staying up very late. Now it's 11 o'clock, so uh, <laughs> let you get to bed so you're ready for your grandson in the morning. Uh, yeah, it's so great to be with you. I'm so glad that I, can, I could exchange small, small talks for you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Thank you.